Okay, what we're going to do today is we're going to go ahead and do an install of Debian Squeeze, which is the Debian stable release as of this December or uh, January 2013. Anyway, we're going to want to download the network uh, boot CD, and we're going to want to do that just uh, from the FTP site of Debian. So we're going to go to ftp.us.debian.org. Going to go under Debian. We want to go into Disks. Under Disks, we want to go to Squeeze. Then we're going to want to go to Main. And this is a uh, Intel 64-bit processor, so I'm going to get the installer-amd64 directory. I want to go to current, images, we're almost there guys. Okay, so we have a CD-ROM install, hard drive media install, a net boot, and uh, I'm going to go with the net boot because I'm on a network and uh, I have easy access to the internet. <clears throat> and what I have here is I have a mini ISO and I'm just going to select that and download it. And once it gets downloaded, I'm going to burn it to ISO image. Um, Hold right on, and we'll take you to the boot screen. Thanks. Okay, well, we've gone ahead and downloaded the mini ISO and burnt it to a CD, and now we've booted off it on a completely new system. What we're going to do is we're going to go through a bare bones Debian install, and we want to start by choosing advanced options. Once we've chosen advanced options, we're presented with another menu, and we want to select Expert Install. We're going to go ahead and be presented with our install screen, and we're pretty much going to take the defaults on most of this, so you know, just kind of keep your eyes open on it. So we're going to choose a language, and I'm choosing English. I'm going to choose United States English, what a surprise. And for my locale for the system, I'm going to select uh, the us.etf-8 locale, which will allow me to see Asian and uh, advanced symbols. Now I can add additional locales, but at this point um, I don't see a reason, so I'll tab over to continue, hit enter, and then we're presented back with our main menu. We're going to select a keyboard layout. We're going to select PC style and American English. Again, these are all the defaults. Um, we're also going to detect network hardware now. And the reason that we're going to do this is this is going to be a net install. Now, it's asking me about PC MCI resource ranges here. And it really isn't anything important. I, uh, I can just continue through this. Now I'm going to configure the network. Now it's asking me if I want to configure with DHCP and the network I'm on does have a DHCP server. So I'm going to say yes. If I say no here, it's going to take me to a screen that will allow me to configure my network. So we're just waiting for the DHCP to get an address and there we go. It's getting this host name from the DNS or from the DHCP DNS lookup, and I'm going to go ahead and rename the host. I'm going to call it something a little bit more descriptive. We'll just call it, oh, let's call it bears and bear install. It's now prompting me for the domain name, which again uh, is gotten right now from DNS reverse lookup and it shows as accusa.net. That is my actual domain name so I'm going to go ahead and just hit enter on that. Now it's asking me to choose a mirror of Debian. So I'm going to go in, I'm going to choose my protocol as HTTP and I'm in the United States so I'm going to select United States and the default is the ftp.us.debian.org mirror which is the same mirror that we selected originally. So we're going to go ahead and hit enter on that. I am now presented with uh, 
a request for any proxy information. In other words, is there a proxy server on my network? In my particular case, I'm not uh, limited by a proxy, so I can just hit enter here and continue through. It now is going to request which version of Debian I wish to install. Debian comes typically in three versions, as I mentioned before. Squeeze, Wheezy, and Sid are currently the stable, testing, and unstable versions. We're going to go ahead and install the stable version or Squeeze. So I'll just hit Enter on the default. It's asking me to go ahead and download installer components. We'll go ahead and do that. Now, this is an interesting screen. I get a lot of questions on this when I'm talking to people and showing them how to do installs. This, these are just basically additional things that you can add to the installer. Um, one of my favorites, I'm just going to scroll down here, is, let's see, where is it? There we go. Uh, Network Console continue installation remotely using SSH. And this is invaluable if you're trying to set up one of these remotely and you have a, uh, a remote hands person on the other side that basically is booted off the CD and you walk them through getting this far. Once they do this, they'll be prompted for a password and at that point you could remotely SSH into the machine providing of course that the SSH ports were open and be able to complete the install and um, relieve your remote hands person pretty much. Anyway, we're not going to do that today. I'm just going to tab over to continue and away we go. So this is basically installing uh, and retrieving the minimum stuff that we need to move forward in the uh, setup. It's now asking me to go ahead and set up my users and passwords. I'm going to enable shadow passwords. If you're curious about shadow passwords, I suggest that you uh, take a look at Wikimedia on it. and uh, it, might, uh, it might just give you some neat historical information about the shadow file. And I am going to allow root uh, login here. The reason is that I'm not going to have any normal user accounts on here, just root account. Quickly saying the password, asked me for it twice. Now it's asking for a normal account. And again, this is a bare bones system. It is going to be a router, so I am basically going to say no. It's going to ask me now to configure the clock. I can now get the uh, clock from an NTP server. If I select yes, it goes ahead and provides an NT, uh, NTP server that's nearby. Hit continue. Uh, it now is asking me my time zone. I'm on the west coast of the United States, so I'm in the Pacific time zone. I'm just going to go ahead and select that. Um, and now I'm going to allow the system to detect whatever hard disk I have on the system. It didn't come back and complain, so I believe that means that we actually found a hard disk. Let's see. Partition disks. And yes, it's asking me how I want to partition them. I can do a guided uh, using the entire disk. And in this particular installation, that's the easiest. I'll go ahead and go with that. And it's asking me to select the disk. Uh, this happens to be a VM that we're doing this demonstration on. So we'll select this disk. Uh, only one there, so not a lot of choice. And I'm going to select all files on one partition. It's showing me what the partition table is going to be. I'm happy with it. We'll go ahead and say yes. And this now asks me if I want to write these changes out. So I'm going to say yes there as well. So we're now formatting that disk. Depending on the size of the hard drive, this could take a little while. This is only a 12 gig hard drive, so it goes reasonably fast. Now let's go ahead and install the base system. This is going to install the balance of the packages that are required to take us up to the next level of the installation. These are also um, the packages that we'll probably need on the system in total. In other words, there's only a couple additional things that will get installed after this. So it really uh, really isn't a big deal. 
depending on your internet connection, this could take a long time or a short time. Um, I'm most likely going to just uh, fast forward this a little bit, so we'll catch you at the end of this install session. Okay, so we're back and uh, we're seeing here being asked what kernel to install. The, it always defaults usually to the right kernel. Uh, in this case, absolutely. This is a meta package just defaulting to that will make sure that we always have the most current and secure version of the 2.6 kernel. So we're going to select that. Now the next question is kind of interesting. It's talking about the init rd, and if you're unaware of what that is, that's actually a um, very small RAM-based file system that's used for um, getting the system up enough that it can see the drives, and then once it can see the drives, it can get the rest of the information off the drives. Um, it wants to know if I want a generic one or a targeted one. The reason that you would use a targeted one would be if you had very low memory, uh, or if you had a very, very small disk, such as something under a gig. God, it seems ironic that I say under a gig is a small disk, but hey, it's the world we live in, right? 99.9% .9 of the time, I would just recommend choosing the generic and include all available drivers. That way, if you ever have to swap some particular hardware out because of a hardware failure, uh, you have a better chance of being able to get this thing booted again. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and install that kernel and get the initrd all set up. It's kind of interesting because it, it throughout the process, installs additional packages based on decisions that you make during the install. Um, kind of neat, actually. All right. So now we're finally to the point where it's asking us to configure the package manager. The package manager is basically the system that uh, uh, allows you to install packages off the web from the command line. Um, if you had a full system, you'd have a GUI on this, but we're not going to do that on this particular install. Um, now that I've selected it, it's going to ask me some questions. So the first question it asks is, do I want non-free software? Now, a lot of people uh, misinterpret what this is actually saying. It does not mean that it's going to immediately install non-free software. What it means is that when you do a search on the packages that are available, it will include those non-free packages in your results and allow you to install them. I uh, always choose yes on this. It's completely up to you. Now. These are a couple update services that are built into Debian. You have the security updates, which I very strongly recommend that you use. And you have the volatile updates, which are updates that uh, have, uh, they basically, you have software that has changed so much since the release has come out that um, not upgrading to that software would be detrimental to the operation of the system. Um, in order to get into volatile, it would mean that you're actually changing versions of software uh, or software packages as well as possibly having to modify configuration files. So a volatile install package could break a service where you'd have to interact and reconfigure uh, it. I always have both of them on. At a minimum, make sure security is selected. I'm going to go ahead and tab over to continue. And now it's adding those repositories. It's going to go ahead and update that. And now we're ready to select an install pack, uh, software, which ironically, we're going to 
select no software to install because all the software that we basically need for the system to boot up and operate as a base system has already actually been installed. Again, if you're on a slower internet connection, this can take a little while. Uh, we're, we've got a pretty quick connection to the, to the uh, mirror servers here, so it uh, goes pretty quick. Okay, now the system may anonymously supply the distribution developers with statics uh, or statistics about the most used packages. I usually don't want to install um, the popularity contest package just because uh, my installs aren't exactly what a normal user would install. And again, we're doing a base install here. We're at installing absolutely no packages. So sending them that information is kind of fruitless for them and waste bandwidth for me. So I'm going to say no. The next question has to do with man pages and if you're not familiar with uh, Unix systems every command has a manual page. We access that uh, with a command called man and it creates databases and all sorts of stuff so we can look that stuff up quicker. This has to do with set user ID for the man user and be honest with you it really isn't something that we need to really be concerned about um, I always take the default which is no now the most important part of this entire demonstration is about to be revealed to you again we want to install a base install the reason that we chose uh, the advanced install was to give us access to many of these questions. So we're going to go ahead here and we're going to unselect graphic desktop and we're going to scroll down and unselect shared system utilities or standard system utilities and we're going to verify that none, absolutely none of these package groups are uh, selected. We're going to tab to continue and hit enter. All that's left now is to install the bootloader. I'm going to install Grub, which is the default bootloader. It's actually Grub2 to be technical. Right now, it's basically evaluating the system, making sure that Grub2 will work on it. It's now downloading Grub2. And it's informing me now that this is a new installation, and the only operating system on the computer is the one that we just installed, which is correct. And it's asking me if I want to install Grub on the master boot record. And the answer to this should always be yes on a spare bones Debian only system. It's going to go ahead and install Grub to the master bootloader. And at this point, it asks us, do we ready, are we ready to finish our install? We are. System clocks are generally set to coordinated universal time or UTC. Guess what? For Unix systems, this is absolutely true. Uh, if this was a Windows system, it would be set to local time. But for any Unix system, this would be the way that you go. So we're going to answer yes here as well. And now, by clicking continue, we are going to see if our install worked. There we go. That is the GNU Grub bootloader and it's going to automatically boot into Debian. And there we are. We have our login. I'm going to log in as root using the password I set. And look at that. All right. So the next installment for this is going to be the packages that we need to install and the bare minimum settings that we need to set up to make this a router. Okay, guys. Talk to you soon, and hey, I hope you enjoyed it. Bye now.